was it was for the love of that fucking game that he did it. Like it was my only uh my only PowerPoint for this and a half years. Oh, yeah. 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 Um I can't remember her name. She was one year or two years ago. Doris. I can't remember her name, but she no, she's from Bermuda. All right, we're starting the next panel. Yay! Good afternoon. Can you see me? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Christine Espinel. I'm the co-chair of the Colombia Human Rights Committee. Um, and I'm here, and I'm very happy to moderate this panel, and also a little nervous, <laughs> because this, <laughs> okay. Um, this panel on foreign and independent economic model will examine the regional shift away from neoliberalism and toward the new economic proposal to rebalance power in the hemisphere. Before giving the floor to the first panelists, I would like to say that this is a, is a vast topical with, with ramifications in all of our economies. In my own country, Colombia, we see how the embrace of neoliberalist policies uh, beginning in the early 90s and has led to the destruction of much of our, our agriculture and domestic food produ production, leading Colombia to depend on food imports, despite we have a, a lot of land and fertile land. And this has only exacerbated all these um, neoliberalism and all these policies. The only thing that is doing is in exacerbate the rural inequality. Colombia has the highest rural Gini coefficient in the world, a crucial factor for driving the ongoing violence as many young people in rural areas see join one of the armed forces. In looking for a salary to live because they don't have anything to do in the, in the countryside anymore. Um, okay, and even the progressive governments in the region, including Colombians, most content with neoliberalism economies and uh, as they are bringing them under control and adopt regulations that uphold people's rights and lines to profit and power of private capital. And now I'm going to, um, now I'm going to give the floor to the first panelist is Kevin Young. Okay, Kevin Young is a teacher 
um, on Latin American history at the University of Massachusetts. He is the author of The Blood of the Earth, Resource National Revolution in Empire in Bolivia, 2017. And, um, and he also, uh, also wrote a book about Venezuela's under siege, about U.S. sanctions and Venezuela's communist expiration in participatory democracy. Kevin? All right. Have the, you have okay. the floor. Thank you, thank you. Um, so let me preface this by saying that uh, I think that not everything I say uh, is going to be news uh, to all of you today. Uh, some of it you will have heard before, but I am gonna try to provide a little bit of additional information and evidence uh, that you can hopefully use in your own work uh, once we leave this room today, uh, your education and your organizing work. Uh, so please feel free to steal anything that you want from the PowerPoint that I'm going to show. So these are the three questions uh, that I was asked to address, and all three of these questions are huge. Um, there's no way to address them comprehensively, so I'm going to try to hit on a few key points. So the first question, uh, what strategies do U.S. and Latin American elites use to thwart progressive reform? Well, a lot of the strategies are actually very similar uh, to what we see in the United States, things like the, the strategies that you see on this slide here. Um, these strategies are described in detail in a report from 2018 from Oxfam and Claxo, uh, which I really recommend. It's really a detailed report on exactly this question of how Latin American elites try to thwart um, attempts uh, specifically at progressive tax reform in uh, different Latin American countries. Um, but the same mechanisms really do apply in all different policy areas. Um, the report itself uh, doesn't actually deal with uh, some of the other mechanisms that elites like to use, though. Uh, so I'm going to focus on some other things today. So, of course, U.S. military aid, uh, U.S.-led political subversion, the things that we've been talking about all day today, uh, and uh, two other mechanisms in particular that I'm gonna focus a little more on uh, because they relate directly to the economy. So U.S. sanctions being one, we've already heard uh, quite a bit about sanctions today. And there's a fourth form of coercion uh, that I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about, which uh, stems from the structural power that capitalists enjoy because of the fact that they control investments and they control the resources that the rest of us depend upon. So it's not just uh, U.S. government imposed sanctions that inhibit attempts at reform. It's also the fact, the very fact of the structure of our economies, of our global capitalist economy that gives private investors and markets so much control over the decisions that affect our lives. Uh, so this sort of refusal to provide the resources that people need is much more routine, in fact, than sanctions. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about that. So these last two strategies that you see derive their coercive power from the fact that we depend on the resources that capitalists control. So that's jobs, it's loans, it's the availability of housing, it's all of the essential goods and services that we depend upon. Those who comply with the wishes of U.S. and Latin American elites are promised new investments, new loans, new products, while those who dissent are threatened with the withdrawal of those resources. Now this is similar to the structural power that capitalists wield within the U.S. economy. Here, whenever government signals the slightest challenge to business prerogatives and privileges, government is threatened with the loss of jobs, loans, investments, and everything else. We see this, for example, in Chicago with the recent election of a progressive mayor, right? The way that business is reacting to Brandon Johnson's election. We see, we see the same dynamic at play in somewhere like Brazil after Lula's recent reelection. Business leaders uh, looking at Brazil are now warning about the disinvestment of capital that is going to follow uh, from even the slightest progressive reform that Lula tries to uh, enact. 
Uh, so take, for example, Lula's recent uh, announcement of a new tax on crude oil exports. As the oil giant Shell uh, recently threatened, uh, this is going to lead to uncertainty about new decisions regarding investments. So that's a thinly veiled threat that we are going to deprive your economy of the resources you need. These threats of disinvestment are sometimes just hot air. Sometimes they're just hyperbole, but sometimes they are carried out. Sometimes they actually become what we can call capital strikes, the withdrawal of investments. For instance, Venezuelan capitalists waged a capital strike against the Hugo Chavez government from his first term on, culminating in a uh, massive oil industry lockout, 2002 to 2003, and continuing after that in a variety of other forms. The flip side of these threats is the promise to deliver new investments and aid if government behaves properly. So basically, do what we want and you'll be rewarded. So in the case of Central America, Biden has this thing called the Partnership for Central America, which uh, involves pledges of several billion dollars in new private investments in the region. However, US-based corporations have made clear that in return for those investments, they expect further deregulation, uh, as well as infrastructural investment from both US and Central American governments, All right? So the goal of this strategy of leveraging your control over capital is to induce a change in policymakers' uh, behavior. So it's having some effect in Brazil already. Lula was in Portugal this week courting business, courting investors, and trying to reassure them that you can still come to Brazil, right? And what he was promising specifically is that his government will maintain fiscal discipline the way that investors like, right? So that's what business tries to achieve with these threats. Now, another expression of this reward and punish approach involving the structural power of investment capital is uh, the so-called free trade agreements. And I know that Jose Luis is going to talk a little bit about these, but you know, we're talking about NAFTA uh, and its uh, successor agreement, CAFTA, and other bilateral trade agreements. Um, without going into much detail here, I want to make two points about the misnomer that is the term free trade agreement. Uh, free trade agreements are not about freedom, and they're not centrally about trade either. So what do I mean by that? Trying to get my slide to advance. There we go. Oh, at once. So they do, they do involve greater free freedom, but for people with already with uh, resources, right? They don't involve freedom for the, for the rest of the population. So a uh, few examples. Uh, they eliminate tariffs. Uh, between countries, but they don't uh, eliminate subsidies to industry. So the U.S. Uh, agribusiness sector has long enjoyed lavish subsidies at taxpayer expense. And one of the reasons why NAFTA had such a dev devastating impact on Mexico's agricultural sector was precisely because the, the long-standing U.S. government aid to private agribusiness. Uh, so, you know, CEPR uh, has done a lot of great work on the, the impacts of NAFTA. Uh, 1.9 million uh, net jobs lost in the, in the Mexican agricultural sector as of 2017. Right. Uh, another example, uh, they free up cross-border investment. They don't free up uh, cross-border migration. So glaring uh, contradiction there, at least if we're uh, taking them at their word that they're trying to promote freedom. A uh, second reason, oh, sorry, let me go back. A second reason why free trade is a, is a misnomer is that these agreements are not primarily about trade. They're actually more about giving investors extra privileges, enhancing the, the advantages that investors already enjoy. So through some of the mechanisms that I've shown here, right? And I won't go into to detail on these, uh, but just to say that the FTAs are another example of capital wielding its structural power over governments and over populations and actually codifying that, that power into law. Uh, one of the explicit goals of agreements like NAFTA and CAFTA is precisely to lock in, as commentators often said, lock in neoliberal economic policies such that when new governments come to power, uh, reform-oriented governments, they find it very hard to break out of the mold of this neoliberal straitjacket. Right, Jose Luis can talk a little bit about that in the case of Mexico. 
So what this effectively does is it insulates crucial decisions about economic policy from the democratic will of the population. Now, most of what I've said to, to this point also applies to our domestic US political context in the United States. This structural power that is wielded by the owners of capital is clearly apparent in the US as well. In the context of Latin America, though, threats of economic withdrawal are accompanied by other weapons that magnify this corporate and imperial power still further, such as sanctions enforced by the US government. So what the sanctions effectively do is intensify the structural advantage that businesses and investors inherently enjoy within a capitalist economy. Sanctions constitute capital strikes that are ordered and enforced by the US government. Now, the official justifications for this kind of policy Five minutes. Are, are familiar. Uh, we you know, heard a lot about national security and so on. Uh, Obama's famous declaration in 2015. Uh, there is some precedent for this sort of outlandish claim. If we go back to uh, the case of Cuba in 1961, this is what the, US, uh, the Mexican ambas ambassador to the US had to say at the time. Uh, we can't, you know, Mexico is a US ally, but even this was a bridge too far for them. They said, we can't publicly declare that Cuba is a threat to our security. Uh, 40 million Mexicans will die laughing. So the powerful always gaslight their victims, of course. So it's not about uh, uh, national security, maybe it's about democracy and human rights. Uh, this doesn't pass the laugh test either uh, for a number of reasons that we can talk about. Um, so the real justification, the real logic behind these sanctions policies uh, goes to the fact uh, that uh, Latin American autonomy has always been viewed as a threat. Uh, and this is clearly articulated in the internal government policy documents. Um, now, the logic of sanctions follows directly from that. Uh, so I'll just give you a few uh, historical examples. Maybe they're familiar to you, maybe not. Uh, the explicit uh, intention of these sanctions, uh, they're very clear about it. So we're not imputing motives when we're saying that sanctions are designed to strangle civilian populations. Uh, if we go to Chile, 1970, uh, perhaps even more uh, direct, uh, the quotation from the U.S. ambassador and a uh, quotation from the Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, talking here about uh, one of the, the larger goals of uh, the sanctions against Chile, which was to prevent the prospect that Allende can consolidate himself and that the picture projected to the world will be his success. Because if that happens, Chile's model effect could be insidious. So the threat here is that it could convince other people in the global south that maybe they have a right to control their own destinies as well. All right, so this goes to the, the heart of what we're talking about in this panel about the threat of an alternative in, uh, economic model. So the same logic behind these sanctions applies today in the 21st century. I'm not going to dwell on this, uh, but uh, the, uh, you know, we can talk more about this. Uh, this the panel earlier this morning also uh, uh, reference the quote from Mike Pompeo from 2018. Um, it's worth emphasizing here that there is a bipartisan agreement on the goals behind these policies. Uh, so the, the criticisms when they do emerge are basically about uh, the execution, right? They're about the tactical failure of the policy, not the fact that they're killing tens of thousands of people, not the fact that they're illegal, right? Uh, to give you one, uh, to go back to this report, which uh, if, uh, it was mentioned earlier, if you haven't read it, I uh, definitely recommend it. But this report from CEPR, which found that there were 40,000 uh, uh, casualties in Venezuela in just the first year of the financial sanctions. Uh, this is, by any reasonable standard, one of the most important documents uh, of recent history about Venezuela and the impact of sanctions. Yet, how many times has it been mentioned in the US press? Well, I did some database searches, and by my count, it's been mentioned once, right? One time in four years, right? And that's at a point when the, the US press is mentioning Venezuela constantly. All right, now, just to uh, skip forward here and um, say a word about, I always try to fit too much into a presentation. Um, alternative policies, right? So. 
this is a big question, um, but you know, we can look to the experiences of Latin American social movements, Latin America's own progressive and revolutionary movements over the last century, including over the last couple of decades. Um, so uh, the kinds of alternatives that movements in Latin America have been promoting are a combination of what we might call social democratic reforms, which are things like uh, all of the stuff that you see here, you know, it's pretty common sense stuff. None of these ideas are coming from me. They're not original. Um, but uh, in relevant to the, the, the theme of the panel here and what I was saying about structural power, uh, it's, it's uh, also important to think about the kinds of reforms that are going to reduce and eventually eliminate capitalist ability to disrupt the economy, to remove that structural power that capitalists enjoy by virtue of the fact that they control all of the resources that society depends upon. All right, so uh, some of these are not just social democratic reforms. Some are actually uh, 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 involve uh, wholesale uh, transformations of economic structures to deprive capitalists of that ability, all right? Uh, so I think I will uh, leave it there. I know I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. And now we're going to go to the second panelist, Jose Luis Granado Ceja. <coughs> Jose Luis Granado Ceja is a journalist and political analyst based in Mexico City. He is the staff writer with Venezuela Analysis, covering regions and <coughs> international issues and writes a monthly opinion column in the Mexico Solidarity Project. He is currently pursuing his master's degree in defense of human rights in the university, La Universidad Autónoma de la Ciudad de México. Jose Luis, tiene la palabra. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, I decided to title this Mexico and the Cost of the Defense of national, national Sovereignty because that's kind of the basis of how the political struggle, especially over the last few months, has been expressing itself and it's sort of a way for me to kind of sum up what's happening. And I think if we're looking at Lopez Obrador's economic policy, it can actually be somewhat summed up by this quote from him himself where he says, we, show, we must show that modernity can be forged from below and without excluding anyone, and that development does not have to be contrary to social justice. And for those of you who are familiar with sort of the developmentalist uh, history of Latin America, that's sort of the same kind of a rescuing of that kind of thinking. And I'm gonna use that word intentionally a lot. I think we can sum it up, uh, you know, Mexico's fourth transformation. We call it the fourth transformation because the first one was the independence struggle, the second one was the reform period, the third one being the Mexican Revolution, and this one being the fourth. And like I said, you can basically sum it up as being an anti-neoliberal and nationalist development strategy to redistribute wealth via the state and to drive economic development in the country. So there's been a massive expansion of direct cash transfer programs under this administration to the degree that now 71% of Mexican households benefit from at least one social program. Uh, the minimum wage has been increased 90% in real terms over the last few years of this government. And then I wanna focus on these last two points, which is what we've seen, which is the, what we call the rescue of Pemex, the state oil company, and the Comisión Federal de Electricidad, the electricity company. Of course, also coming with that is the nationalization of lithium. This is just a quick graphic that shows um, the priority programs of the government. I'm gonna go through it and just pass it real quick, but it gives you an idea of just the broad range of what the government is trying to do in various areas of, of the Mexican economy and social life. So when we talk about the National Electricity Company, what we've seen is a reversal of the liberalization that happened over the neoliberal period, which is to say basically since the late 80s in Mexico until the revival of Lopez Obrador in 2018, what we're calling the second nationalization of the electricity industry. It was originally nationalized in 1960. And what this is is basically trying to bring the Mexican state back as the majority uh, uh, generator of electricity. So that gives them control over the actual market. Very recently, the government actually purchased 13 power generation stations from the Spanish multinational Iberdrola. Gives you an idea. So instead of selling off public assets, they're actually buying it and bringing them in. Uh, and now the Mexican state will maintain 65% of energy generation by late 2024, which is when Lopez Obrador's term will end. He cannot seek re-election due to the Mexican constitution. 
The next one would be Pemex, the state oil company. So it was like so many things that we've seen, I think particularly in the United States uh, and Canada, uh, which is that they s deliberately starve it of investment to try to basically suffocate it. Uh, and it was part of a neoliberal scheme aimed at privatization, which is to say that, oh, it doesn't work as a publicly owned, state-owned company, so let's privatize it, right? But that's actually all been turned around, in fact, deliberately so as part of the, uh, the economic policies of the government, which is to say that an actual turnaround in oil production, they purchased the Deer Park refinery in Texas, six existing refineries that were basically rusted out, have been uh, rehabilitated and now refurbished, and, are and they're building a brand new refinery called Olmeca in Dos Bocas, Tabasco. And so you can get, see the figures there. The, the expectation is by 2024, there would be energy self-sufficiency. The next one is the creation of Litio MX, which is the lithium, the state-owned lithium company. Uh, Mexico has um, many reserves of lithium. As we know, it's the new white gold. It's a key to the energy transition. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of interest from multinational companies to control this, but we're seeing this trend throughout the region of bringing that under state control in order for it to benefit the population. And that's no exception in the case of Mexico. Uh, the, they were actually officially nationalized in April of 2022, and the state-run oil company will have exclusive rights to mine lithium. And I think it's important, as we continue talking about this, to focus a second on the political reality in Mexico. So 2018 saw a landslide victory for Lopez Obrador and the uh, Morena party, his political party. And since then, I think this is really important because it informs the way that uh, the opposition has been responding, is that they've actually won 12 out of 15 governorship races. There's one coming up very soon, which uh, Morena is also expected to win in the state of Mexico, which has been ruled for nearly a century by the PRI. Uh, so the opposition parties, the PRI, the PAN, the PRD, and Movimiento Ciudadano, they have been unable to articulate a coherent response to this political reality. So the opposition finds itself compelled to mobilize in the streets, but it struggles to engage citizens and win support on a political basis. And so what does that lead to? This. And I think this is kind of the central uh, hypothesis of, of my presentation here. They're unable to win the pop win over the population, and so they seek to assert power and influence via other means. Uh, and what are those other means? Well, we have, if, if you've been watching the news, you've probably and been t and seen the news around Mexico, it's been around this reform to the electoral body. We call it the INE. Um, and so what they've done is try to kind of latch on to this issue in order to try to win some legitimacy, win some support from the Mexican population. Uh, I want to go really quickly just because of time, but you know, they obviously, like other Obviously, like um, in, in other parts of the world, you know, they retreat into the private media, they use the courts, and what our topic of today, right, into the arms of imperialism. So this is, a, this is the way that the elites in Mexico are trying to, despite not having political power, be able to try to influence the situation inside of the country. And so I call them Mex the, the conservative strongholds. So, you know, I was talking about this, uh, the defense of the Electoral Institute. Just really quickly want to mention, you know, so the opposition mobilized its supporters. They held a successful rally. A lot of people took to the streets, 200,000 people. I think we should be honest that they were able to mobilize around this. Uh, but here's the interesting thing. Lopez Obrador called for his own demonstration in kind. And in that case, there was actually an estimated 1 million people in the streets of Mexico City. And so you can see, this is an iconic picture of the day. I didn't take this picture, it's by a colleague of mine, but you can see kind of like the sea of people and it's, 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 quite, it's quite the powerful image. But you can, here, you know, this is a picture of mine. You can see, uh, you know, the people coming out to the streets, showing their, their demonstration and answering on the street and, and by mobilizing to say, um, okay, fine, you took your supporters out, well, we have ours and we're five times as much. Hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, as they were going through the, this process of the, of, uh, ultimately they weren't able to get the constitutional reform passed because you need a, a supermajority to do it in the Congress. Um, so they presented a plan B. Same thing, opposition sees this plan B, decides to mobilize against it, and same thing. Uh, in this case, I would say that it's important to point out where the first one they were trying to seem like, oh no, we're just here to defend the Electoral Institute, we're just here to defend democracy, where have we heard that before? This second rally, they were explicitly political. They were mobilizing on a political basis against Lopez Obrador, against Morena as a party. And so, 
as, as, as should be done in these cases. What did the president ask for? Well, he also asked for his supporters to march again. And similarly, we see a mass turnout filling the Socalo, an estimated 200,000, 250,000 people, again, larger than the opposition's demonstration. You can see here another picture of the Socalo. Anybody who's been in Mexico, it's that huge public plaza at the center of the city, totally filled with the supporters. And I wanna really focus on this last one. You can see that banner at the top um, where it says, uh, in defense of national sovereignty. And I think that's really important because they're doing it on those terms. We're rescuing that kind of terminology and the people who are attending these demonstrations understand what it means to stick up for their own country's sovereignty. And I think that's in the face of attacks of imperialism, that's really critical, right? Um, and you can see there, there's this deliberate effort to tie to historical moments. This, this, this rally was called on the 85th anniversary of the nationalization and the expropriation of the oil industry in 1935, you can, or sorry, 1938. See the picture of President Lázaro Cárdenas there. Uh, and then until López Obrador's left, that's López Mateos. He's the one who originally nationalized the electricity industry. And in the middle, López Obrador, wh uh, who nationalized the lithium industry in 2022. So you can see that, that this effort to construct ties to the historical situation. So, and like I said at the, at the end there, there was a deliberate effort to tie the current government policies to the monumental and popular decisions by previous governments to put the resources in the service of the welfare of the people. Uh, I want to feature this quote from somebody who I spoke to. Uh, he's a member of the Political Education Institute of the Morena, the, the ruling party, and he says, we in Morena feel we are the heirs of those struggles. Our heritage is the fight for social rights, for political rights. That's why we connect ourselves to these old struggles. Although they are from the past, although they are still very present because today it is still necessary to defend everything that Cárdenas fought for, what López Mateos fought for, what Pancho Villa and Mariano Zapata and so many other popular leaders fought for. And so I was talking about these conservative strongholds. So like I said, um, despite the fact that the opposition had its own mobilization, they haven't turned it into electoral victories. They continue to be very marginalized in terms of public support. There are states where they will probably still win, uh, but mostly we can say that they are declining in terms of their political power. So again, they, re they retreat into their conservative strongholds. And in this case, we can see at the top there, this headline where the electoral reform was was halted by the courts. The second there is the free trade agreement uh, that Mexico has with the uh, United States and Canada. Uh, you, that's a pretty uh, offensive headline for me. U.S. plans ultimatum. There we go. A U.S. plans ultimatum in Mexico, uh, energy dispute raising threat of tariffs. And this is what uh, Kevin was uh, alluding to in his presentation, this idea that you can use these instruments, these agreements that have been signed by these countries in order to directly interfere and force the country to do the bidding of the transnational companies and of international capital. And then that last one is the one that I'm going to conclude on, which you can see this headline, Mexico takes another step towards authoritarian past. And this is what's going to open up the path to interference from U.S. imperialism. And I, I want to read this first quote from that last uh, headline that I read, where it says, the last thing that AMLO wants to do at the swearing-in ceremony for Mexico's next president is place the presidential sash over the shoulders of an, o over the shoulder shoulders of an opposition president-elect, and in doing so, jeopardize the legacy of his so-called fourth transformation and the survival of his pet projects and policies. What does that lead us to think? Well, it kind of sounds like they want to commit fraud, right? It makes it sound like, well, the only way that the Morena is going to stay in power is if they manipulate the vote. It couldn't be further from the truth. Obviously, politics is very fluid. Things can change. But as it stands today, overwhelmingly, it doesn't matter who the candidate is because they haven't chosen the successor yet. Morena wins the next election. And so they're laying this. <laughs> they're laying the foundation for this undermining of the legitimacy of the next government in Mexico. In order to do what? Well, to apply sanctions, to start to question the legitimacy, question their ability to say we have a mandate to do what we're doing. And like I said, the, this labeling of a, le of a leftist leader is a threat to the country and democracy. It's a, it's a classic strategy. We've been talking about it all day here at the conference, right? And I think there is a danger, right? Is it the, by laying this foundation, this is, as someone who, I, I work a lot on Venezuela, 
this is how it begins, right? This is how they start. Now, these days, you read any mainstream coverage of Venezuela, and they talk about 2018 like it was a flat-out fraud, right? But they never justify it. They, but they've managed to install it into the mainstream discourse, and this is what they're trying to do in Mexico. This is why we've seen all of these uh, uh, op-eds and, 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 and opinion pieces talking about the so-called authoritarian regression in Mexico. But obviously, this is also an issue of class struggle, right? His policies are a threat to US and Canadian capital, right? When you nationalize key industries, those industries that are interested in extracting surplus value from those activities feel threatened, and they ask for their state actors to support them, right? This is why we see headlines like that, where the US is threatening uh, ultimatums. Like, who is the US to, to, to give us an ultimatum, right? And so, like I said, it says here, Mexico to act now or else, you know, uh, in terms of, or otherwise we're going to apply tariffs. We're going to collectively punish the Mexican people by making them have to pay more for collective goods, right? USMCA, uh, the, the, the free trade agreement, this is important in that speech that he gave in the Socalo he mentions this, right? It fills me with great pride to be able to recall today that despite the policy of granting concessions that prevailed before we came into office, we were able to remove a long chapter from the free trade agreement that compromised our oil and put in place a small paragraph, which I'm going to read to you, and you can see it there. The United States and Canada, this is in the free trade agreement. This is something that his negotiators put in. The United States and Canada recognize that Mexico reserves its sovereign right to reform its constitution and domestic legislation, and that Mexico has direct, inalienable, and imprescribable ownership of all hydrocarbons in the subsoil of the national territory. Yeah, I think that deserves a round of applause. But this is how bad it's getting. We're literally seeing now threats of invasion, right? Uh, and they're using the drug war as an excuse, but this wouldn't be happening if it wasn't Lopez Obrador or Morena in power. They're, you, they're threatening us literally with drone strikes without the authorization of the Mexican government. What is that? It's an act of war. And these absurd ideas have started out as fringe ideas and have become mainstream, certainly in the Republican Party, but also the Democrats have failed to push back on this. Instead of saying, no, we're not going to bomb our major trading partner, they've been saying, we'll take it under consideration. That's an insult. With friends like that, who needs enemies? Okay. And so I just want to end with this, with a one minute, I know I only have a minute left, but I want to end with a one minute clip from Lopez Obrador from the demonstration that day, because the Lopez Obrador in front of a massive crowd is the best Lopez Obrador, you know? <laughs> it's really where you get to see his, uh, his roots as a social leader. And it's subtitled, so don't worry. We recordamos a esos políticos hipócritas e irresponsables que México es un país independiente y libre, no una colonia ni un protectorado de Estados Unidos. y que podrán amenazarnos con cometer cualquier atropello, pero jamás, jamás permitiremos que violen nuestra soberanía y pisoteen la dignidad de nuestra patria. Cooperación, sí. Sometimiento, no. Intervencionismo, no. Oligarquía, no. Corrupción, no. Clasismo, no. Racismo, no. Libertad, sí. Democracia, sí. Honestidad, sí. Justicia Social, sí. Igualdad, sí. Soberanía. There you have it. One, one final point, and I'll close on this because I know I'm out of time, that there is a struggle that's happening. We're going to need to ramp up our solidarity efforts. Uh, I want people to, I'm involved with the Mexico Solidarity Project. Please get in touch. Please join our newsletter because this is what's coming next. We know that 
there will likely be a deepening of the process, a radicalization of the process, and that's only going to bring more attention, more of our enemy spears towards us. And you can see this quote was also from that same day. I am convinced that we will continue to receive the port of the people to consolidate, and I put that in bold, the first stage of the transformation. There's more stages to come. I ask myself this question. How do you move a political project forward when the political media and economic establishment is largely dead set against you? By turning to the masses, by flexing your capacity to mobilize to your rivals. You know, and this final quote from the person I quoted earlier, I think it's very important that the opposition knows, and I would add imperialism, that there is a population here who is defending a national project that is popular, that is from the left, that is progressive, and is trying to do what's best for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Viva! Viva! Viva. Um, thank you, Jose Luis for your presentation and from bring us these beautiful words from the president of Mexico. Um, now we're going to present Alex Main. Alexander Main is director of the International Policy and Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington, DC. His areas of expertise include Latin America, Latin America in integration and regionalism. U.S. security and con contra, contra narcotics policy in Central America, U.S. development assistance to Haiti, and U.S. relation with Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Honduras, and Venezuela. He holds degree in history and political science from the Sorbonne University of Paris. Oh, thank you, Christina. Okay, this thing's working. Um, okay. Um, well, first of all, um, I want to say a big thank you to the organizers of this terrific conference. Um, they worked their asses off, Michelle, Medea, and others, so let's hear it for them. Um, congratulations on pulling it off, and it's great to have a conference like this with, you know, a big diversity of perspectives and covering so many topics. I think it's something that was really missing here in Washington. and. Um, so I'm at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, uh, which is um, a think tank here in Washington, D.C. Um, that some of you may know. Uh, you can find our work at CEPR.net. And since I'm at a think tank, I'm going to talk about a wonky topic, uh, the International Monetary Fund, policy from the International Monetary Fund. But I want to start out by saying that this is not such a wonky topic for many people in Latin America, where it has a real effect on people's everyday lives, and often a very painful effect. For instance, when the price of public transport suddenly goes up, or public health care services disappear, or masses of public sector employees are laid off, millions of people across Latin America have taken to the streets to protest IMF-backed structural adjustments in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Brazil, in Venezuela, all over the place. Many of these protests have been violently repressed, such as the Caracaso in Venezuela in 1989, in which thousands of low-income Venezuelans were massacred, or the protests in Ecuador uh, more recently in 2019, when at least seven indigenous protesters were killed and over a thousand were injured. You may wonder, since we're talking about burying the Monroe Doctrine here today, what does IMF policy have to do with the Monroe Doctrine exactly? And as it turns out, a hell of a lot. The US, the US government has enormous control over the policy decisions of the IMF and I would argue has used that control to maintain a neo-colonial grip on economic policy making all over the global south and especially in Latin America and the Caribbean. The IMF was set up shortly after World War II, mostly with the input of the US government, a little bit from the UK government, and it was designed in theory to promote global financial stability by being the world's lender of last resort for countries facing major financial difficulties. So when countries in the Global South reach a point where they, they need more outside cash to keep their economies going and have trouble borrowing that cash from private markets, they often turn to the IMF. 
but they don't do it with much enthusiasm at all. Uh, the IMF imposes conditions on their lending, often including major structural reform that sets countries on very different economic courses than what they started with. And they're often very painful, very harmful economic courses that create a lot of human suffering. So the U.S. is the biggest shareholder at the IMF and basically has veto power over many of its major decisions. And together with a cartel of other wealthy countries, they set policies that make sense for big creditors in wealthy countries, but very little jobs, all sorts of good stuff. In reality, due in large part to U.S. influence in the institution, the IMF has been an aggressive instrument of economic intervention in favor of Wall Street and neoliberal policy. Great for foreign corporations and big investors, but really terrible for ordinary citizens and for long-term development. And the IMF has had a particularly destructive role in, the, in Latin America. Its influence grew enormously in the early 1980s as a result of the Latin American debt crisis, which, by the way, the U.S. played a big role in, but I don't want to digress on that too much. But as a result of that debt crisis, Countries in Latin America ended up turning to the IMF, and the IMF's lending portfolio became really huge. And this happened to coincide with the very moment when there was a global neoliberal offensive in full swing, led by the governments of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And archival research uh, that was recently done has shown that in the early 80s, the Reagan administration heavily intervened in the IMF to expand the scope of its involvement in so sovereign economic policy making in countries. And as a result, in countries where the IMF had lending programs, the IMF began aggressively pushing a very neoliberal agenda, downsizing of the public sector, privatization of public services and enterprises, enterprises cuts to social programs, deregulation, the elimination of capital controls, and very importantly for Latin America, the abandonment of state-led industrial policies aimed at protecting and fostering domestic production. And these industrial policies were prevalent throughout Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s, and then, in large part because of the IMF's influence, they were abandoned. Now, the promise that the IMF makes to um, the peoples of the countries where they're involved in is that if you, may, if you let the markets rule, that will eventually lead to more productive investment and trade relations. It'll create more prosperity for everyone. But this free market, trickle-down theory has largely been debunked and perhaps nowhere more than in Latin America where the growth numbers, the economic growth numbers speak for themselves. So you often hear of a lost decade of economic growth in Latin America. And the reality is even uglier than that. As my organization showed in a report we did back in the early 2000s, for the two decades from 1960 to 1979 in Latin America, per capita growth totaled around 80%. Now, if the countries of the region had continued with that growth rate for the next couple of decades, they would be um, among the advanced economies, the wealthy countries today. Instead, from 1980 to 1999, precisely during the era that IMF-backed neoliberalism was dominant, growth in Latin America only reached 11% during those two decades. So during the 1980s, the average yearly per capita growth was negative, negative 0.3%. During the 1990s, it averaged less than 1.5% per year. Fortunately for Latin America, during the early 2000s, when the first pink tide swept the region, almost all of Latin America had weaned itself off of the IMF and countries were able to implement more independent policy agendas and with very strong results. So sectors that had been privatized were renationalized in many cases. Social investment grew enormously. More of the national income of countries was redistributed to the poor. And as a result, tens of millions of people were lifted out of poverty throughout the region. And growth rates also improved. So with the IMF out of the picture, 
things were starting to look much better. But the reason that we're talking about the IMF today is that the IMF is very much back in business in Latin America and in much of the rest of the global south. And this comeback really began during the global financial crisis. And then it became an even bigger comeback during the pandemic when dozens of countries ran out of foreign exchange, out of dollars, with which to address the public health emergency and economic In response to the global economic downturn caused by the pandemic, the IMF did do a couple of positive things. First, it initially provided tens of billions of dollars of emergency financing without all the usual strings attached. So countries weren't, didn't have policy agendas imposed on them by the IMF. But more importantly, due to unprecedented outside pressure from a lot of the world and from the US Congress, from some members of the US Congress, it actually did a really good thing. It, it issued hundreds of billions of dollars of free financial resources known as special drawing rights to all of its 190 member countries. I'll get back to that. But for the most part, the IMF was back to its old tricks. Even at the height of the pandemic, traditional IMF lending programs remained in line with the, us the usual um, neoliberal agenda. And for example, in Ecuador, the government made major layoffs um, tens of thousands of public sector workers were laid off in the middle of the pandemic and greatly exacerbated the, the public health catastrophe there. Today, the pandemic isn't even totally behind us and the IMF is systematically calling for austerity, austerity, cuts to public budgets. Countries that haven't even recovered from the pandemic and are being hammered by escalating food and energy prices are being told to tighten their belts. So something else that really needs to be emphasized about the IMF, and that takes us back again to the Monroe Doctrine, it doesn't treat all countries equally. In fact, the treatment countries get often ali aligns with US policies towards countries. And in many ways, the IMF is really an arm of the US foreign policy machine. So for instance, as I'm sure you're all aware, the US is increasingly engaged in a new Cold War with China. And recent research uh, published by some academics from Boston University has shown that countries with close relations with China, with the closest relations with China, and that have lending agreements with the IMF have faced more invasive economic policy conditions from the IMF. And they've been forced to engage in more austerity. Whereas countries that are closer to the US have had much more lenient conditions from the IMF. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, historically, we've seen the IMF play the role of the US and the US government. So in Latin America, we have Cuba and the United States. And in South America, we have the United States and Colombia. Um, Cuba provided the Cuban government, the US Cuban government, and the Nicaraguan mafia with nearly $60 billion one year ahead of the presidential election there. And it was clearly designed to help boost the mafia of that election. Unfortunately, he completely mismanaged the economy, uh, unfortunately for him, and um, fortunately for the country, he lost to a progressive candidate by Jose Fernandez. But then Fernandez ended up with the $60 billion debt to pay back. And that's created enormous constraints on economic policy making in Argentina and has really contributed to the country's current economic crisis. Another important case is Venezuela. In 2002, um, you had a coup against Hugo Chavez that lasted just 48 hours. Well, during that coup, you had the IMF spokesperson who said, we stand ready to assist the new administration in whatever manner they find suitable, which was completely in line with the US throwing its full support behind the coup government of Carmona Estanga. And more recently, the IMF has been supporting the current policy towards Venezuela, effectively sanctioning the country as a result. In 2019, when the US administration created a parallel fictitious government under Juan Guaido, and stopped recognizing the government of Maduro, the IMF abruptly stopped recognizing Maduro as well. That decision had a major impact during the pandemic when first of all, 
Venezuela didn't get any of that emergency financing. It could've, could've gotten $5 billion worth of emergency financing. It was barred from getting that. And more importantly, it didn't get $5 billion worth of these special drawing rights that I mentioned earlier. To this day, the IMF continues to not recognize the Maduro government, and Venezuela is still unable to access its SDRs. So even though both the Maduro government and the Venezuelan opposition have asked for these SDRs to be released, they haven't been released. So by, at this point, you're all asking, what the hell are SDRs? Um, so <laughs> I'll go over that very, very quickly. They are a positive policy from the IMF. We haven't seen much of them. They're issued by the IMF. They are assets that are issued by the IMF at no cost. They don't create debt for countries. There are no conditions attached. Therefore, the U.S. has generally opposed them. Um, but there was a major allocation during uh, the pandemic in 2021. $650 billion worth of these SDRs went to countries and provided an enormous amount of relief, and again, without any strings attached. The world could use another allocation of SDRs right now, but then surprisingly, the U.S. Treasury doesn't like this idea. They don't like the idea of countries getting resources for free. Let's just got a minute, it'll be really quick. And so all of this, I think, is just a reminder of the fundamental flaw with the IMF. It's not a democratic institution. It is U.S. controlled and responds above all to the U.S. government and by extension to the interests of the U.S. financial sector. So. In summary, and I'm going to skip over part of what I was going to say, but if we really want to help bury the Monroe Doctrine, then we need to take on the IMF. We need to hold it to account for the damage it's done and is continuing to do in Latin America, and we need to support the development of an alternative financial architecture. So we can work with progressive members of Congress to hold the IMF accountable for its deadly austerity policy. We can push for more of the one good policy at the IMF, which is SDRs, which is something that progressive leaders in Congress are already doing. There's a coalition of groups working on this issue. If you're interested, please connect with me. Um, and then here in the US, we need to build awareness and support for the efforts of progressive governments to consolidate Latin American independence. Right now, just last week, as a matter of fact, the leaders of Brazil and Argentina um, called on the other progressive leaders of South America to help them relaunch UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations, to build closer political and economic cooperation between the countries of the South American continent. And they are dusting off an old project of, from the early 2000s of a Bank of the South um, and a common unit of exchange for South America. They are trying to create an alternative financial architecture to counter the influence of the IMF. So we need to support these efforts, we need to show solidarity with these efforts, and we need to stop the U.S. from interfering to prevent these efforts from taking place. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And now we're going to present you Nick Stiff. He's a PhD. He is from the, he's a citizen of the Lower True Tribe. He is, an, he is an assistant professor in the Department of American Indian Studies at the University, at the University of Minnesota. In, for, in 2014, he co-founded the Red Nation, an indigenous resistance organization. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, was the American Democracy Fellow of the Charles Warren Center for Studies in the American History at Harvard University. Yes, you have the word. I'm um, um, My name is Nick, and I'm from I'm Kuichasha from the Lower Borough Sioux Tribe. And today, I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the political economy of U.S. settler colonialism and imperialism as it relates to the Monroe Doctrine and the so-called Doctrine of Discovery, as well as the present moment and the energy wars that are taking place in Latin America, in, uh, in Europe, uh, as well as here in North America. And lastly, I want to talk about alternatives and what burying the Monroe Doctrine 
uh, after 200 years uh, is, is opening up and the possibilities uh, for not just this hemisphere, but for the rest of humanity. So I want to begin with the doctrine of discovery. Uh, in 1823, there was a Supreme Court decision uh, that was determining whether or not the Cherokee Nation, which was targeted for, for removal in the state of Georgia, uh, had rights or had standing within the United States. Chief Justice John Marshall cited 15th century uh, papal, uh, 15th century papal bull, uh, which is you know kind of commonly known as the doctrine of discovery, as the 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 governing principle by which the United States asserts its ownership of this land. Meaning that you know the United States is not a Protestant nation by any means, but it inherits the Catholic right of discovery from the Pope himself. Uh, as, a, as a way to uh, enact ownership of the land and to dispossess indigenous people. And within this dis decision, uh, John Marshall wrote, the Indian nations had always been considered as distinct ind independent political communities retaining their original natural rights as the undisputed possessors of the soil from time immemorial, but they were, quote, the weaker power, thus surrendering their independence to a more powerful nation. And out of this Supreme Court decision came other Supreme Court decisions that went on to define indigenous nations within the United States as so-called domestic dependent nations. And the relationship is one of, to quote Marshall again, a state of pupillage uh, or as a ward to his guardian. So this happened the same year that uh, James Monroe went forward and made his famous speech that became known as the Monroe Doctrine. Um, this Monroe Doctrine actually descends or traces its origin to the original debates uh, when the founding, you know, with the founding of the Constitution in 1887. It was Alexander Hamilton who pushed uh, for what he was calling a fiscal military state to levy taxes on the new citizens of the United States to raise a standing army and to create a centralized military system to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, attack from two dual threats, one of which was named uh, in the Declaration of Independence as the 23rd Grievance against the King, and that was the so-called merciless Indian savages on the Western frontier, and the second was competing European powers, such as France, Britain, and Spain. So to kind of fast forward a little bit, um, the other founding father, Thomas Jefferson, created a system of treaty making that would, he, what he called, binding the indigenous nations to uh, the United States. And this was part of his broader vision of what he called the um, empire of liberty, right? Which would start from the, the North Pole and go all the way to the South Pole, where America was the center, you know, the central sort of project, the, the political, cultural, and racial project of the Western Hemisphere. And what he meant by binding indigenous nations to the United States was essentially if they signed a treaty with the US, they could not go and sign a treaty with another European power. Um, so this policy of what we know as Indian policy or domestic policy is intrinsically tied to the United States foreign policy and how it's beginning its, its first relations, international relations with what they saw as independent nations, as indigenous people, and then you know, you, you know, newly independent states in Latin America. So fast forward to 1893. The United States was on the verge of war with Spain to expand its overseas colony. It was the same decade that the US Census Division had declared the Western frontier officially closed. Uh, and, it, and at a time when the American Indian population was believed to have reached its lowest point in known history, decimated by more than a century of genocidal war, famine, and disease. Um, and in 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner, who's an American historian, uh, famously known for you know, developing the so-called frontier thesis, said that he found the germ of the Monroe Doctrine and the genocidal wars waged against indigenous peoples in the Ohio Valley. Meaning that those lands initially, initially desired by the United States were the same lands that the colonists cited when they were declaring independence from the British Crown, saying that the British Crown had prevented them from expanding their institutions of chattel slavery, of expropriation into the Ohio River Valley. 
Um, but this, you know, the violent westward drive from the Ohio Valley to the coast of California, Turner, Turner argued, was the start of the definite independence of the United States from the state system of the old world, the beginning, in fact, of its, its career as a world power. And it was also this year that in 1893 that uh, the United States overthrew the Hawaiian Kingdom in the Pacific. And in fact, the grandfather of uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles, who was known as Grand Foster, uh, Grandfather Foster, um, was the first Secretary of State to participate in the overthrow of a foreign government. And in this case, it was an indigenous government. And he, he, he said, the native inhabitants had proved themselves incapable of maintaining a respectable and responsible government and lacked the energy or will to improve the advantages with provident, or which providence had given them. Grandfather Foster went on to mentor his two grandchildren who became one, the founder of the CIA, right? John Foster, or um, Alan Dulles, and then a uh, former, you know, a, a subsequent Secretary of State, uh, John Foster Dulles. These two individuals uh, engineering their own coups in Latin America and throughout the world, but taking inspiration from their grandfather, who was the first Secretary of State to overthrow a foreign government. And so I want to I want to take that those principles and thinking about how the United States has structured its relationship both internally to indigenous nations as well ex externally to the Western Hemisphere. And I want to look at two policies. The first is uh, the Obama era policy known as American energy independence. And under this program, Obama increased domestic oil supply or oil production by 80%, specifically targeting indigenous lands or federal, federal lands itself. Um, this was largely due to what is known as the fracking boom, right? The, the, the new technology in fracking. But also it coincided with um, a, a, uh, a broader sort of drop in price of oil as, some, as uh, the economist this morning mentioned earlier. I'm not an economist, by the way, um, I, but I'm on an economy panel. <laughs> Um, but I want to say that there, is, there was a direct link between the ongoing uh, Venezuela crisis and oil production in North America. When global oil prices began to fall, there was a subsequent North American oil boom, both in Canada and in the United States. And in the United States, they were developing the tar sands in uh, Alberta. So they also began to target and to they also began to target and to uh, isolate the Bolivarian government of Venezuela, who was using the money from its own oil production for the benefit of its, of its own citizens, its own, you know, its own uh, countrymen. Well, at the same time, you know, this oil boom that happened in North America began to wreak havoc on indigenous nations with the creations of new oil pipelines, the tar sand dead zones in Alberta, the fracking rigs and refineries, locking these North American economies into a drill and drill mentality at the expense of indigenous lands and lives. This boom also weaned the United States off of its oil imports uh, from uh, you know, countries like Venezuela as well. Um, and it was, you know, it was during, the or during the Obama administration, during the Dakota Access Pipeline struggles that there was a protester who was interviewed in, on Democracy Now! running to the pipeline uh, front lines, and she said that the reason why they're building the, the Dakota Access Pipeline is because they're sanctioning the oil in Venezuela because it has the largest oil reserves in the world. So indigenous people on the ground were not confused that this was not just a domestic pipeline struggle, but it was a power, it was a geopolitical struggle between the United States and the alternatives that were being created and fought for in Latin America. So both Canada and the United States drilled their economies out of the gutter following the financial collapse uh, in the, from 2008 to 2011. Meanwhile, Venezuelans voted in of the Bolivarian Revolution into power, which in turn increased the participation in social, economic, and political life of indigenous peoples whose rights were codified in the, new, uh, the newly minted Venezuelan um, uh, constitution, as well as women, LGBTQ people, black folks and poor people. The nation's oil wealth was, in a sense, redistributed to the lowest sectors of society. And this also, this oil wealth was also redistributed to North American indigenous nations, 
And in fact, my first uh, entry into uh, Venezuelan politics or understanding the Bolivarian Revolution was when CITGO um, had gave my tribe heating assistance during the cold winter months. And I remember this because my dad called me and he said, son, they're filling up the propane tank. I told them to stop. I don't want to pay the bill. And so, <laughs> so we, uh, we called and I, I found out that this was a, um, you know, a solidar an act of solidarity on behalf of the Venezuelan government. And it, it meant a lot to me because during those winter months, they jack up oil prices. They artificially increase or inflate oil prices, as well as the local uh, utility commissions. They pop off electric um, meters in the middle of winter on the reservation. And to give you an idea of how devastating that is, Buffalo County, which is across the river from our reservation, which is the Crow Creek Nation, the Crow Creek uh, Sioux Reservation, is one of the poorest counties in the United States. And they were popping off electric meters in the middle of winter. There was no national coverage of this whatsoever. So that single act of solidarity resonated within our communities and I made it a point that if I ever traveled to Venezuela, I was going to thank um, Hugo Chavez, but unfortunately he had passed away. So I, I thanked his predecessor, Nicolas Maduro, who is the same height as me, believe it or not. <laughs> I thanked him on behalf of my family and my community, as well as our nations, for being there when the United States, the most powerful, richest nation in the world, lets its original people go without heat or choose, have to choose between food and heat during cold winter months. So skipping ahead, I want to talk a little bit about, of course, we, we know what Trump did under his uh, unleashing Amer American energy independence and the ramping up of the development of o oil and gas production in the United States and Canada and, and pushing through pipeline after pipeline. Um, but also, I want to talk about the success of the resistance. And the success of the resistance within North America is that the indigenous-led movements, whether it was from Standing Rock to Line 3 to even the, the North Slope of Alaska, those indigenous-led movements were challenging 27% of greenhouse gas emissions from both Canada and the United States, which is huge. So as they were challenging these greenhouse gas emissions uh, during these decade-long you know, struggles against carbon infrastructure, carbon extraction, you know, the Willow Project just recently went through because Biden, Biden said that it was, it was to offset the price of uh, oil and heating in Europe uh, because of a war that he's backing in Ukraine, right? So we can even see the proxy war in Ukraine that the US is backing is also fueling uh, dirty, car dirty carbon projects here in the United States that are affecting indigenous lands. But also the Biden administration has committed to green energy. And that's where we, that's where we, we have to take a critical look. While we all want a sustainable transition, it can't be the, at the expense of indigenous people. The, we can see that the lithium mines that are being developed at Thacker Pass in Nevada or at the um, at Oak Flat in, uh, in Arizona come at the expense of indigenous people. Copper is essential for the transition for creating um, you know, green renewable batteries and electrical systems. Of course, lithium is for uh, batteries themselves. But this so-called green energy revolution uh, is also looking to the south and looking to push out countries like China who have invested into uh, Latin America to help these nations develop their own you know, path to resource nationalism. And in this case, it's a you know, green resource nationalism. And in the case of you know, certain countries, negotiating what those contracts mean for indigenous people and development to offset the most deleterious aspects. Whereas the, whereas the Biden administration isn't negotiating whatsoever with indigenous nations. So even though the Pope has repudiated the doctrine of discovery, in action, the United States is still practicing it, right? So even though John Kerry repudiated the Monroe Doctrine, the series of sanctions that followed in the Obama administration, the Trump administration, attempted to strangle and to choke out the, the alternatives that were rising against neoliberalism in places like Cuba, in places like Venezuela, but also the plurinational governments of places like Bolivia and the overthrow 
of Evo Morales. And so as indigenous people in the United States, we, our policy, our policy for green energy is fundamentally anti-imperialist, has to be fundamentally anti-imperialist. And it cannot come at our expense, nor at the expense of our relatives. So as we bury the doctrine of discovery, let's bury the doctrine, or the Monroe Doctrine as well. Um, thank you very much to the panelists, and they led us with a very good analysis and resources to continue to fight against all this injustice. As I mentioned at the beginning, in Colombia, the, the, all these politics that we are talking about here cause a lot of problems, especially to the peasants, the indigenous, and the Afro-Colombians. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for the panelists. So we're going to take uh, a break. We're going to have. We're going to continue at four o'clock. Just remember, we're going to take a, a short break and to come back into the auditorium at four o'clock. And over there, on, uh, towards my left, we have an idea a collection board. If you folks want to write. And uh, there's this beautiful art right here to check out. Wow, it's coming out well. Hey, right. who's ready to bury the Monroe Doctrine? Yes. Also, you've probably seen the beautiful Cuban art exhibit that's there. They are also for sale. We just sold one.
causes of immigration. Is everybody excited? That's right. Is everybody ready to grab a shovel to bury the Monroe Doctrine? There we go. All right. Thank you, Yamir, for the excellent job. So, um, in a way, I am really happy that we are the last panel because it's going to be an opportunity to reflect back on many of the things that were said in uh, the previous panels. It would be an opportunity to try to round up some ideas. And uh, right now we're going to hear from Yesenia and, and Carla and then Gustavo, three amazing leaders, which I'll be describing their amazing work in a minute. But we're very honored and happy to have them. And um, before they speak, I just want to say, just like we heard today, sanctions, fake free, free trade agreement, and all the other mechanisms that the US have established to keep Latin America against the wall are purposely planned, and they know the consequences that all of these actions have. The same happens with migration. It's been proven by academics from the US and across the world that forced migration across Latin America, it's mostly a consequence of neoliberalism. When the United States tried to redesign the market economy of the region, they knew and they projected, it's, it's been documented, that there was going to be human displacement. They knew that the markets will scatter around the region, and as a consequence, people will move across the region. As the previous panel mentioned, one of the parts of, of the free trade agreement with Mexico was to stop subsidizing uh, agricultural industries in Mexico, not in the US. So they always knew that campesinos and indigenous folks will be forced the, the uh, move out of their communities. So migration is another form of displacement, another form of sanction, another form of fake promise of economic progress. But, but it's one of the most harshest and the consequences of this bad planning are one of the harshest, saddest, and most terrible consequences that our region has played as a consequence of the Monroe Doctrine. And I'm just going to close by saying um, we've learned today that it is proven that the Monroe Doctrine has failed over and over and over again, but not for the US. It has not failed for the purpose of the US. So it is not going to stop just because we proved them wrong, but we cause, because we uh, break free in Latin America, because we stop cooperating, collaborating with these policies of death, as they were mentioned. And, and uh, we'll, we'll say it at the end, but when our countries break free from the Monroe Doctrine that day, the US will be on its own and will be forced to reflect and, and, and ask for help to, to the countries in the region because the main reason why the Monroe Doctrine is in place is because the US needs our labor, our resources, our land, and by itself, it's not the same country that is right now. Let's please let me welcome um, Yesenia, Yesenia Portillo. Please give us a big round of applause, please. Let me just read a little bit about her very quickly. Yesenia is the program director at CISPES, the committee's, uh, the committee's solidarity with the people of El Salvador. In her role, Yesenia has supported coalition building and strategic campaigns 
to raise awareness and push back against the most harmful impact of US policy in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In 2022, she helped uh, lead a delegation of progressive members of Congress to Central America to learn from grassroots groups about the consequences of the mil militarized and corporate-driven solutions that drive U.S. policy in the region, including through the Biden-Harris plan for Central America. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Um, so I have some slides. Yay. Um, so yeah, first of all, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it's really an honor to be here, especially with Carla um, and Gustavo. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the Biden-Harris um, camp uh, program to supposedly address the root causes of migration first. Um, so the Biden-Harris campaign platform on immigration included um, a focus on addressing the root causes of migration from Central America, particularly from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, which was echoed in the U.S. Citizenship Act proposed by Democrats in February 2021, shortly after Biden took office. After the proposed legislation sweeping pro-immigrant elements were watered down and mostly died in Congress, the elements related to addressing the root causes of migration made up the White House's U.S. strategy for addressing the root causes of migration announced and published in July 2021. This policy framework has seen more than $1 billion in development aid from the U.S. State Department via USAID and other programs, and the creation of the 501c3 Partnership for Central America, with over $4 billion committed from the private sector. The next slide. Um, a couple of years prior, as yet another mass migration crisis moment hit U.S. mainstream media headlines in the form of caravans of people banding together in numbers larger than ever to migrate, migrate through Guatemala and Mexico, I noticed a shift in the way the mainstream media was talking about migration from the region. At first, it seemed like finally an acknowledgement of the role that the U.S. has played in the conditions that continue to lead to mass forced displacement. A closer look makes it clear, however, that these conversations fall short. Um, in the bottom right uh, is a, a, a screen grab, I guess, of a five-minute clip from Samantha Bee's full frontal segment, which aired in June of 2019. She focuses on El Salvador and describes the billions that the U.S. spent there in the 80s to fight communism. She even talks about the major role that tough on crime policies of the 90s in Los Angeles and Bill Clinton's immigration reform played in the birth and expansion of MS-13, the transnational gang that became the major scapegoat against migrants under Trump. In the end, however, Samantha Bee's segment made it seem as though Salvadorans are only migrating because of gangs, mentioning nothing about um, more contemporary U.S. police and military security financing in the region, or the impacts of current U.S. economic policies towards El Salvador. I find it interesting also that even though at the time a large portion of the migrants in these caravans were actually fleeing Honduras, the focus of the segment was El Salvador in the 80s, rather than the ongoing political support for the coup government and narco dictatorship in Honduras that continued on from when President Obama and Vice President Biden uh, were in office. The other image is from a 10-minute MSNBC segment where the speakers react to a press conference um, held by Vice President Harris in Mexico City after receiving major backlash for telling migrants in Guatemala do not come. In the press conference, the Vice President explains some of the work she's been doing within the framework of the U.S. strategy for Central America. During the segment, host Joy Ann Reed does a really important job of acknowledging the long history of U.S. profit-driven destabilization in Central America and its deep impacts, mentioning the United Fruit Company and the U.S.-backed coup against Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, for example. While an acknowledgment of the history of, exploited, of the exploitative nature of the U.S. relationship towards Central America is necessary, I'm sad to report that the analysis in this segment also assumes that this relationship is in the past. After several minutes dedicated to explaining how, quote, the United States used much of Central America as essentially a giant plantation, the speakers ultimately go on to say that the U.S. needs to now fix the economy, the instability, and the corruption there, applauding vice, the vice president for her efforts 
And remember, this is just a day after the scandal surrounding her do not come um, warning to migrants. Congressman Espiot says in the interview, I think we have to uh, take a deep dive to find the root causes. Here, uh, her going there is taking the first step, take a deep dive and find out what must be done to build public-private partnerships. Maria Hinojosa says, I'm very happy to hear that there is going to be such an extraordinary investment. And Joy Ann Reed, despite her acknowledgement that the quote, um, that quote, the deep corruption in the region is in part um, because of our policies, closes by applauding the anti-corruption elements of the plan. Ultimately, what is happening here is a co-signing of the current White House strategy um, and a discussion of it that assumes there's something novel about it. Today, US foreign policy towards the so-called Northern Triangle is increasingly discussed as a necessary part of the plan. Oh, sorry, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, for curbing migration. Uh, what we've been hearing from Democrats is that in order to address the issues of massive flow of migrants to the US, uh, to the US's uh, southern border, the US must solve the root causes of why people are fleeing. This is an appropriation of the demands coming from popular social movements in the region and grassroots solidarity organizations in the US, which have for decades denounced the destabilizing role of US intervention. So if you look at the plan, it identifies these things as the major root causes of migration from the region, corruption, violence, trafficking, and poverty. And then if we can go to the next slide. Um, so let's look at the strategy for addressing poverty with some highlights here. Um, promoting, promote investment enabling reforms, address structural impediments to investment and facilitate greater private sector par um, participation, partner with the private sector, partner with international financial institutions and multinational, multilateral development banks. So does this look like something novel to us? <laughs> okay, so next slide. Um, if, how much time? skip this one. Um, well, anyway, so it's within this framework. Ooh. Okay, it's within this framework that the Vice President makes her call to action to the private sector to deepen investment in Central America and an NGO made up of the uh, top leadership of corporations like Nestle or Nescafe rather, Microsoft, Pepsi, and MasterCard is created. It's described as a coalition of private sector organizations driving practical solutions to advance economic opportunity address urgent climate, education, and health challenges, and promote long-term investment in Central America. Next slide. Um, the strategy for addressing violence and trafficking can be summed up with these highlights. Professionalized security forces, improve civilian policing, counter-organized crime, increase capacity of law enforcement, and other security forces. And now also, it's important that while the strategy claims to be aimed at addressing uh, the root causes of poverty and violence, or the root causes such as poverty and violence, it's also explicitly talked about as necessary for curbing China's economic influence. Uh, next slide. Um, so the next few slides is a timeline of US foreign policy towards Central America since the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, it is informed heavily by Aviva Chomsky's excellent article, The Root Causes of Migration from Central America, the US. Uh, the first slide is a little more reflective of the nature of the article and that it does it doesn't just look at the policy frameworks towards the region, but also the way they were implemented. Starting here with the Monroe Doctrine in, 19, in 1823, reinforced in 1905 by the Roosevelt Corollary. Next slide. Um, for the next couple of slides, I included just the policy frameworks and the names of where they came from. The Alliance for Progress under Kennedy, which Francesca ta mentioned, uh, the Santa Fe docs and Christinger reports that informed Reagan era policy and really post Reagan era policy. Um, and I'm really going to plug Aviva Chomsky, the Aviva Chomsky article here again because she provides crucial insight on the impacts of these policies and hint they led to worker disenfranchisement and increased mass displacement. Uh, and she also provides some insight as to how the workers and negatively impacted communities of Central America responded. And so next slide. Um, taking us into the 2000s, we have CAFTA uh, and billions of dollars of military and security financing through the Merida Initiative, the Central American Regional Security Initiative, or CARSI, and I think Plan Frontera Sur should go here as well. All policies to promote a favorable climate for the private sector and to secure police and military control over the region for border enforcement and to supposedly combat organized crime. The Obama era also heavily promotes private public partnerships, 
and the Alliance for Prosperity in included hundreds of millions of dollars for international narcotics and law enforcement. This policy was also supposedly in response to what's known as the child migrant crisis and claimed to be the answer to addressing the reasons why people continue to flee the region. The Biden-Harris strategy operates under similar frameworks and promotes similar solutions. Uh, and again, I'll close this by naming that a root cause analysis is something that comes from the radical left and it's being co-opted in order to justify policies that are a mere continuation of foreign policy frameworks towards the region that are at least two centuries old now if we start with the Monroe Doctrine. Thank you. Um, of course, we know that resistance to the U.S. economic model is long-standing in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, while U.S. development aid is based on a logic that is that it will supposedly improve things like uh, systems of health care, education, electricity, and water in Central America. We know that what it actually promotes first and foremost are privatization schemes, um, bringing in private corporations to run these essential human goods and services under the logic that corporate management will make them more efficient or that exploitative industries like mining corporations will create more jobs. But we know that corporations increase their prof profits by any means necessary to the detriment of consumers, workers, and the environment. In El Salvador in the 1990s, in the decade following the signing of the 1992 peace accords, over 30 state institutions were privatized, including national banks, electricity, and telecommunications. In the early 2000s, Salvadorans organized mass resistance against the Central American Free Trade Agreement and against efforts to privatize the healthcare system there, knowing full well the negative impacts that these policies had in the previous decade. Two historic struggles that I uh, have had the opportunity to learn about through my work with CISPES are the fights against water privatization and against metallic mining in El Salvador, which, are, which, is, also, uh, which is also ultimately a water defense issue. In 2010, I participated in the Radical Roots delegation, which was CISPES's first delegation to El Salvador for the Salvadoran diaspora. Uh, at the time, El Salvador was being sued under CAFTA after communities successfully organized to pressure the Salvadoran government to temporarily halt mining, a struggle that led to a historic victory in 2017 when it became the first and only country in the world to ban metallic mining. Um, in 2018, mass protests in El Salvador to push back against emboldened right-wing efforts to pass a national water privatizing law. Um, I, yeah, through, so um, when that was happening, I learned more about that history, including that in 2007, the right-wing government of Antonio Saca was promoting a water privatization plan using the language of decentralization, which was a concerted effort by the Inter-American Development Bank, providing loans to the government for the promotion of private sector pri um, participation, using specialized consultants to give support and financial advice to the government towards the effective organization of PS, uh, private sector participation schemes. Water defense activists mobilizing against SACA's water privatization were the first to be arrested under the 2007 anti-terrorism law which shouldn't come as a, as a surprise since it's the same tactics used in all territories with major U.S. influence and increasingly within U.S. colonial borders as well. A little over a year ago, CISPES had the opportunity to work with other anti-imperialist international solidarity groups like Witness for Peace, folks from the Honduras Solidarity Network, School of the Americas Watch, and the Network in Solidarity with Guatemala to coordinate a, de de a delegation to Guatemala and Honduras where I witnessed um, and learned, oh, with progressive congressional representatives, did I say that? Um, where I witnessed and learned about resistance to several different mining projects, many that received financing from the Inter-American Development Bank or the World Bank, uh, or that depend heavily on the corruption of the Juan Orlando Hernandez government, um, that for example, in, Wapim in Wapinol, uh, con um, gave land concessions in uh, national reserves illegally to some of the richest men for open air mining. Um, this uh, uh, under a government that despite the US government's stated concerns over corruption, received unconditional political support and military and police financing. Some of the most devastating moments of the delegation were meeting with communities in resistance who had experienced deadly police attacks 
while putting their lives on the line to defend their rivers, and a mother in Shinka territory that detailed her sadness and fear of her children making the decision to migrate because the Escobar mine had made life unlivable for them and not knowing um, ooh, if her children would survive the journey. Um, okay. So I'm gonna spend the last, I told you one minute, um, <laughs> I have to discuss the uh, fascistic and dictatorial government of Nayib Bukele in El Salvador. Most known to many, oh, we can change to the next slide. Um, most known to many uh, for making El Salvador the first country to make Bitcoin a legal tender, a policy that, like everything else about the government, was nothing more but a major publicity stunt and a mechanism for corruption. Most recently, known for his war on gangs, which, was, which has suspended some of the most basic constitutional protections of all Salvadorans and has led to the arrest of over 70,000 people in just a little over a year. And mainstream headlines claim that Bukele has eliminated gangs in El Salvador. But behind the spectacle of Bukele's mega prison lies mass human rights atrocities and a systemic attack against his opposition, particularly against the left and against organized communities in El Salvador. El Salvador's prisons are 300% over capacity and tens of thousands of people from El Salvador's most marginalized communities have been arbitrarily arrested and held in months on end of pretrial detention in torturous and deadly conditions, with hundreds already dead as a result of their imprisonment, many with signs of violent death and reports of mass torture. The Bukele administration rose to power by co-opting the frustration that Salvadorans felt from the negative consequences of the neoliberal economic model. Um, we cannot understand Bukele's rise to power in El Salvador without the longer context of U.S. military and security financing. Um, while Samantha B. mentioned how MS-13 was birthed, she did not discuss the U.S. role in maintaining those conditions, even through the present day, with billions of dollars for police and military training that limited the response um, to gangs, to punitive policing, a tactic Bukele is using in its most extreme form while doing business with organized crime and arresting union leaders, vocal opponents. And I have to mention our comrades from the historic community of Santa Marta who led that struggle that secured El Salvador's anti-mining ban, which Bukele intends to reverse and are now under arrest. Um, in pre-trial, in an automatic six-month pre-trial detention in deadly conditions. Um, the silence of the U.S. Embassy and, and the State Department, along with ongoing military and security financing, under the excuse of the war on drugs and border enforcement, exposes the hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy that is supposedly based on fighting corruption, defending human rights, and spreading democracy. And so I'll just close by saying, you know, Bukele has um, a, a large, an extremely large publicity apparatus, um, and a lot of people, even on the left, gave him a lot of um, benefit of the doubt, um, but he's clearly promoting the in interests of the global elite via police and military repression. Um, and I welcome everyone to join CSPES and the um, Salvadoran organized communities um, in denouncing what's happening there and in denouncing U.S. complicity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yesenia. <clears throat> very informative and uh, moving presentation that reminds us that what's happening at the border, Mexico-U.S. border, it's not an spontaneous crisis. It's provoked, made, and planned by the United States with the complicity of corrupt governments across our countries. And it takes us to change that. Uh, since NAFTA was signed in the case of Mexico, over three million people have crossed the border from Mexico and the US. And if we add 
Central America could be up to five million people. And if we add folks that are coming from Haiti and South America and, and from uh, Africa and other continents through Mexico these days, it's more than that. It's millions of people who have been displaced as a consequence of these policies that Yesenia just presented. And to continue this reflection, I want to welcome uh, our sister, Carla Garcia. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Carla Garcia is the International Relations Coordinator at OFRANE. She came to the United States in 2013 and works with the Garifuna communities in New York. She has a history of activism and participation in civic action for over 20 years and serves as representative of culture at the national and international level of the Ballet Nacional Folklorico Garifuna. Y so she's also the co-facilitator for the Afro-Descendant Platform that came out of the Peace Summit. Welcome, warrior and leader, Carla Garcia. Thank you, Marco. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And thank you for letting me explain to you our vision as Garifuna community about immigration. I'm going to use Spanglish. That's why I have her here with me. She's going to help me, give me assistance in moments because my English is uh, very fundamental, very limited to. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, this part is practice. You don't pay attention of, of this part. Uh, <laughs> so let me start um, with a reflection. I want to call my ancestors and our ancestors to occupy this space and make us uh, feel their energy and listen to them what they really want from us in the earth not only in our countries or in the United States. Um, people here witnesses what happened this morning. And we need to understand that everything is based in energy. And the pain, the hardness, the forgiveness, the war, the blood also can control energies and manifest in front of us, even if we don't understand that this is some energy coming through our eyes to make us maybe think more about what is happening. I have a double with. Uh, our ancestors, the ancestors of the world, do you believe that it's a good idea to go to Egypt, Egypt, right? To remove bodies from people who lives 300, 500, 5,000 years ago. Or it's a good idea to go to Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras and profound the cemeteries. And uh, what will happen in 5,000 years? They will come to our bodies, for our bodies. Believe in that. And if everything is energy, for example, the slavery that we are trying to talk about slavery, like something that happened, but it doesn't happen to us. Saying this because I know I just have 15 minutes. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I wanna leave. I wanna leave this question in the air. If somebody comes to you with a problem to be solved in a language that you don't understand, with rules that are not your rules. How are you going to do to solve that problem? I can tell about the indigenous and black communities in St. Vincent in the 1600s when the 
colonizers, the people who discover America, came to the islands. And they saw these people looking maybe different, but people, and they tell them, you can live there. But these people said that they discover and they become the owners of the land. We can say in the way that we learn in the universities at school or in this new era that the indigenous community own the land, own the spaces. We're the owners, right? But in our cosmovision, we don't own anything. Everything is to be shared with others. This is the nonsense that we found in the, the history of every community, the history of every poor population. I want to talk about what happened and what I know happened with the Garifuna community in 2013 when they started to come to the United States in big groups. Nobody called them at that time. Um, nobody said that it was a caravan. But it is the moment when everything started. People went in our communities in Honduras, waiting for mothers and child and young people going to the school or coming out from school going back home, and tell them, told them, you can come to the United States. Right now, there's a law that if you, as a mother, have a child, and you um, enroll your child at school, the Obama law will protect you. Come to the United States. And this is the way that it happened. In San Pedro Sula, there were a lot of people with money to um, prestar, borrow, no. to loan them the money that they will need to come to the, the border. Nothing happened to those group of immigrants in the, in, the, in the way coming to the United States. Nothing. No matters. No nothing appearing in front of them to maybe cut the, 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 the dream. As soon as they arrived with the coyotes to the to the south border, they didn't come into the United States without a permission because the border, the police border, went to them, took them, and put it inside of the United States. By that time, a lot of um, young people who already graduate from um, the legal uh, field didn't have jobs. Oh, people is coming through the border. This is the good moment to give jobs to this new generation of lawyers. At the same time, the housing, the court, the immigration court was having less and less and less cases. A big opportunity to fill back the court and to give job to more people to occupy those uh, positions. There was a project in where our women, the women of the Garifuna community were Push to accept voluntary signing documentation in English, saying that they were signing voluntary, voluntarily to be part of the um, GPS monitoring process. And when they arrived, for example, to New York, three or, or four days, oh, because if they did not accept this voluntary project, they were 
supposed to continue in a jail in the border. So the way to go out and meet their families, it was signing this voluntary documentation. So five days later, um, an appointment in the court. They saw the judge, and the judge sent them downstairs at the Federal Plaza building to get the ankle brace, the ankle monitor. And this company that is private and still private was using the Federal Plaza building to put those ankle brace in the, in the people to know and monitor what is the bad consequence in each person getting an ankle brace. Now the ankle brace is a big business after the, the test in the Garifuna community and the Garifuna women's. So why I'm telling this part to you? Because we know and we knew and we tell the community they are removing the people from our communities because they want to own our land. But at the same time, these people must produce because they don't, know, they don't speak English. They will not have a document, legal documentation. They will not start working immediately. So they were producing for this country. And the, at the moment that they arrived to the border, they started to produce, giving jobs to other people in this country. And nobody is recognizing that. But at the same time, our communities in where Ofrane is fighting to continue holding and having the land, started to um, have less people, especially women in the reproductive um, state, child and young people. If you move your next generation to another country with a, with, to learn a different culture, you will not have enough to, to hold the land to continue having the, uh, the fight. And this is what is happening right now in Honduras. The communities are trying to resist all these projects but there's not enough young people to fight for their land. What is happening here? Why they don't go back? Because they still like in a migratory limbo. They go to the court, they just see that they still here and they are in good shape and the, the judge gave to them a letter to return in two or five years. Uh, consent to get a, per, a permission to work, and that's it. Not legal documentations, no nothing, so they cannot go back to Honduras, but they don't have a legal status here. And it's happening since 2013. So why they did this? Do you remember the North Triangle project involving Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. The second big caravan of migration came from the indigenous community of Guatemala, and the third one from El Salvador. Oh, wow. That's a coincidence, right? This is it's exactly what all this day I listen people discussing, how intentionally they are harming us they are harming our communities and displacing us to get the resources, the land, et cetera, et cetera. What is the problem right now? Honduras have a new president, Ms. Omara Castro. But Honduran doesn't have a state. And uh, right now, there's a big movement to remove Xiomara Castro Zelaya from the presidency. In United States who support Juan Orlando Hernandez for 13 years, 
because he was twice president, but he was support before from the United States, was making the job to have the country in the moment that we have now. My concern, because I, I know I have just two minutes, and there's a lot of things that we can say about this. My concern is we still trying to solve a problem in a different language. Because the Garifuna community, as the indigenous community, is never going to see other person as, as something different or something material that we can, from we can get any um, benefit. Thank you. We're going to see other people as people, as us. So we're still involved in a problem that we don't know how to solve. That's why we need the people who live in the United States, who are born in the United States, who understand the United States to help solve that part of the problem. We're going to continue fighting for our life, fighting for our communities. <laughs> but we need you as part of our community, not as, a, as part of the United States community, as part of the world community, to fight together. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. We heard from Jesenia first how the government of the United States uh, publicly presents a project. Then we heard from Carla what in the reality it's happening. What is the other plan? What's the other alliance for prosperity, right? Which is intentionally pushing people out of their communities, taking their resources while forcing them to work in a legal limbo in the United States. Let's welcome our last panelist. Please, a uh, warm applause for Gustavo Torres, please. <laughs> Gustavo Torres, <clears throat> executive director at CASA, the largest Latino and immigrant organization in the Mid-Atlantic. Gustavo came to the US due to the political and economic unrest in his country of origin, Colombia. He joined CASA staff as a community organizer and became the executive director in 1994. And under his leadership, CASA has grown from a small service organization to, uh, to an organization of uh, staff nearly of 150 people and a membership of over 97. Uh, thousand people which operates in multiple states. It's an honor to have you here with us, Gustavo. Uh, thank you. You have 10 minutes. 10 minutes, <laughs> why? Okay, let me see if I can summarize. Let me stand and yes. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. And thank you very much. I just want to uh, share with you our vision and to see if we can, because what I understand that we are here is to try to find the best potential U.S. policy for Latin America. So what I'm going to share with you today is to some ideas that we have, to brainstorm with you, and we need you to be able to make sure that we are going to accomplish that. First of all, I want to invite all of you, May 1st, International Worker Day, we are going to have a rally in support of the immigrant community in front of the White House. Please, please join us. Please join us at noon. It's so very important. The only way how we are going to accomplish whatever I'm going to share with you is because we need to be united. It's the only way how we are going to accomplish that. So please join us one more time. International Worker Day, noon in front of the White House. And let me tell you what we believe. We believe that immigra immigration policies must be grounded in racial, economic, and gender Equity and justice, that's simple. The US policy right now is racist. We know that. So we are proposing to address this issue with five different freedoms to the US government, to you, and to all of us to make sure that we fight for those freedoms. And let me tell you very quickly about the five freedoms that we believe that are very important to change the US policy related with immigration to make sure that we have a different perspective and different world 
because what you see right over here and what our sister shared is totally unacceptable. That is what we face all the time. We have 140,000 members, mostly in the Washington metro area, but also all around the country, and they face the same challenges that you hear from our sisters. So we are proposing five, five freedoms. And let me start it with the first one. The first one is the freedom to transform. Let me describe to you what happened and how our community have been punished. When one of our members commit any crime, they don't qualify for anything in terms of immigration. Nothing, zero, because you are criminal forever, even that you pay for what you did. So we believe that people can transform, and we believe that he, people have the right to a second chance. We believe that when people pay whatever they did, they have the opportunity to receive any immigration policy assistance. Because right now they don't have any opportunities at all. So that is the first one. The second one, the second freedom, is that we believe the freedom to stay, to stay in our countries if we want it. If we don't want to migrate, we want to stay in our countries because we love our countries. Actually, I'm here not because I want to be here. I'm here because the reality in my country, I'm from Colombia. So the freedom to stay is so very, very important. Number three, freedom is the freedom to move. Yes, if you want to migrate from your country to here or to wherever you, have, you want to, you need to have this freedom. That is the minimum. I mean, remember with the, all of these businesses, corporations and all of that, they move to whatever they want, right? Why human beings cannot have the same freedom? So that is our number three one. And we want to have that conversation with all of you, but also with the US government. Because that is the way how we change that policy. Number four, the freedom to work, to work with dignity, with rights. Right now, people who are undocumented, you know what right they have? No rights. So they have the right to work with dignity, to unionize, to create co-ops, to do what they, whatever they wanted. It's so very, very important. So that is number four. And number five, freedom, freedom to thrive, wherever you are, to create a dignity for you and your family and your community, to make sure that you have the right to water, clean water, food, to make sure that you have the opportunity to have a space for you to live with dignity. That is our five freedom and principles that I want to share with all of you, but also with the government or the US government. And we believe that it's very important that we work together to accomplish that. Because yes, we know that the system is broke. Yes, we know that we need comprehensive immigration reform now for the 11 million people who are undocumented in this country. We believe that it's very important to recognize that the immigration system is broke and is racist. We know that, but we need to find solutions to address that. And together we can find solutions. We need to work together to make sure that we not only convince but force the US to change those policies because those policies are totally unacceptable. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Three amazing warriors here at the table sharing their thoughts, ideas, their reflections, and inspiring us to get up and uh, fight. Uh, I don't know how we did it, but we did it. It's 4.52 and, and um, we're gonna get ready for the for the closing remarks uh, from uh, well, our very three special leaders. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a break. We're gonna go straight into it, right? Yes. Okay, we're gonna go straight into it. And uh, let me just close by saying that in the face of 200 years of Monroe Doctrine, it is up to us, the people in the region, 
to change that reality. The change is not gonna come because one day President Biden wakes up and says, I think this is not working. I received sufficient evidence that the, the Monroe Doctrine is hurting people. That's not where things are gonna change. It's gonna come out of our hands, our thoughts, our coming together, resisting, building communities, building solidarity, and sta staying away from collaborating with any of this perverted expressions of oppression, of contemporary oppression. Hundreds of people, including this in this forum, are coming together across the region to say enough is enough. Learn more about next steps on Code Pink, learn, learn more about the Peace Summit and uh, more upcoming efforts. Next year, Mexico and the US are, will have uh, presidential elections, both countries, and it's a unique opportunity to speak when one with one voice. It's now or never. Thank you very much. Thank you, great job, Marco, great panel. Thank you all for being here. And now we are going to have our closing remarks from two wonderful women. And we're gonna start with our sister, Claudia de la Cruz, who is the co-executive director of the People's Forum. Has anybody here been to the People's Forum in New York City? It is amazing. It is our People's Forum, and it's such a great model. Uh, she was born in the South Bronx to immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. She is a popular educator, community organizer, and theologian. Wow. For 20 years, she's been committed to movement building and has actively participated in collective grassroots spaces, particularly in the communities of Washington Heights and South Bronx. So let's give it up for Claudia de la Cruz. Well, while folks um, figure out the slide situation, I do want to thank, and I always do, thank the Valavarian Revolution for its commitment to the South Bronx. Um, it did very much the same thing that they did for the indigenous nations, um, the tribes that uh, Comrade Nick Estes was talking about. Um, and we had the pleasure of receiving our Comandante Chavez there in 2005. And so just want to extend my gratitude to the Venezuelan people because it is their effort that allowed us to be able to have heat in the winters. Um, this has been an amazing event. I wanna thank the organizers, shout out to Code Pink. I have the privilege of being a board member and I'm very honored and privileged to be part of, of that collective of warriors. Um, everything that has been touched on by the amazing list of panelists who have presented today brings to mind the words of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he spoke these words in 1967 in one of his most important speeches, speech that is barely ever kind of taught to us in school and is the Beyond Vietnam speech when he told us that the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. This country was built on slavery, hostility, dominance, violence, rape, coups, military interventions, dictatorships, unitarian coercive measures or sanctions, blockades. It has been built on the dismemberment of humanity and the planet. That is the foundation of the United States of America. And I refuse to call the United States of America, America, because America is a goddamn continent. I think it's important to raise that the globalization of poverty, misery, suffering, the blood and tears, the underdevelopment of the global south has been the down payment for US imperialism. As the presenters shared in the panel on economy, the economic base, the capitalist system is a predatory one. Its very nature is to pillage, to extract, to violate. 
So as we leave this forum, we must be clear that in order to bury 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, we need to dismantle the very system that has produced and maintained it. And it is good for us to be in solidarity with our comrades all over the world. It is good for us to build international projects. But you know what would be better? Do you know what would be better? For the U.S. to take the responsibility of building its own revolution. <laughs> U.S. imperialism, the global manifestation of U.S. capitalism is a cancer. It is the most dangerous pandemic to have plagued the planet. One that must be fought and destroyed if we are to save humanity. That is what is at stake. Capitalism needs to use force to sustain itself. And it also needs to spread fears, to lie, and to manipulate. Amongst the many lies that we've been sold, not only in this country but around the world, is that it is easier for the end of the world to arrive than for capitalism to end. And that is the biggest lie that capitalism has sold to us. It has told us that capitalism is eternal, this is the way things are, that at best, all we can do is reform capitalism. We have been told that imperialism cannot be defeated, and that it is only through imperialist wars and interventions that we gain security and stability. The ruling class has consistently worked to terrorize and lie to us into submission and sink us into hopelessness. And all we need to do is look into history to find out that it is possible, it is possible to bring down empires. All, all empires in history have fallen, but they do not fall on their own volition. They do not fall because they grow a consciousness. They do not grow a consciousness. If we have been listening, we know that the US imperialism has no morals, has no ethics, has no consciousness. Empires fall when the masses of the majority of people, the poor and working class, grow a conscious. When we see ourselves and live in the future, connected to the lives and the future of our sisters and brothers, those who fight imperialism every day, those living in Cuba under a blockade for over 60 years, and building building its revolution. Those living in Venezuela resisting attacks since the conception of its revolution and deepening its revolution with people's democracy. <laughs> Fidel Castro said, and I will raise his name wherever I go. Fidel Castro said, there is very little that those who have chained humanity can teach us. Only those who have broken their chains can teach us. We need to look not into Latin America and the Caribbean as a charity case, as something that we just need to give to. People have resisted for 200 years and beyond. People have learned to live and exist with dignity. That is more than the people from the United States can say. We have a lot to learn from Latin America, the Caribbean, and the global south. The Haitian people, the Haitian people have had to pay for being the first free black nation in this hemisphere. Very few people remember Haiti. We must remember Haiti. So when we talk about burying 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, let us remember our responsibility as people living in the belly of the beast. We are the ones to dismantle this monster. We are the ones to bury the corpse of imperialism because it will not die from age. It will reproduce itself. 
If we go back to history, we know the levels of crises that capitalism and imperialism have faced. And they always find a way to recreate themselves. The latest project was the neoliberalist project. We are in the crossroads of history. At this very moment, we are in the crossroads of history. There is a geopolitical fight that's being fought. And it is up to us, the people in the United States of America, those, who are, those of us who are part of the 160 million people who are living in poverty or below the poverty line, to grow a consciousness. Do you know what that consciousness is? My dear friend Marx called it a class consciousness. Where we understand ourselves as part of the international community of working class people. Where we are able to understand that we have more, we have way more in relationship to the global south working class than we do to the government that does not represent us. When we're able to accept that, and we can convincingly share that with others, we are very, very much few steps ahead to be able to build a change that needs to be changed here. We cannot be part of the lie and tell people that there's any reform that could be made within a capitalist system that'll actually take us where we need to go. So if we want to bury this death machine, we got to study these dead machine. But we must learn from those who have broken their chains. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Claudia. Learn from those who have broken their chains. And one of the really beautiful things that we have done here today is weaving in and out and recognizing the connection between our indigenous sisters and brothers in throughout the Americas, including here in the United States. And that's why I'm really pleased to introduce Judy Talagon, who is a Chumash and Filipina land protector from the Santi Nez Band of Chumash Indians. She is the daughter of farm workers and immigrant leaders who grew up among Mexican and Filipina communities in California. She is a longtime activist. I knew her when she took part in shutting down of the uh, quincentennial celebration of the myth of discovery of Col uh, Christopher Columbus. And she is an organizer with California Indians for Cultural and Environmental Protection. Her work is based on very clear principles, creating a culture of resistance, standing in solidarity with activists from the entire hemisphere and the world, and building up women-led, indigenous, land-backed movements next to and in solidarity with black AAPI and Latinx communities. So thank you so much, Judy, for being with us. Thank you, thank you for welcoming, welcoming me so lovingly. I have allergies, so I'm struggling. Yes, I, I will. So, you know, the question is, what is next? Yeah? And uh, so I want to say that I have the beautiful blessing at this time to participate and find the joy of this event in community, that we see each other. You know, we know each other as a collective, as a human collective, in struggle, and finding our indoctrination, locating it, and healing. Yeah? So I am in uh, collaboration now to the what is next, and that is 30 scholar, you know, research scholars from out of Berkeley, California, out of UC Berkeley, with Professor Moreno and the Latinx Resource Center. And our curricula is greatly based and framed on abolition. And we are going to reintroduce new characterizations to abuse. But what really brought me back to this, and I think that a lot of us are returning 
with great you know, energy to what is next. What really brought me back is Nick Estes and the collective that authored The Red Deal. And that very action. Ah, yes, thank you, thank you, yes. You know, Melanie Yazzie, the, the, I think upwards to over 10 contributors, okay? So that in and of itself is an example of what we need to do in the North. Re-educate, you know, recapture our memory, our collective memory as the collective. So one of the things that we've done, I'm gonna be very act, action, you know, it's sort of join you into participation today. Do you have a pledge card on you? And if Can you we have it Yes. Okay, so in the meanwhile, while they're pledging, I'm gonna tell that story. So every Friday, we're getting ready to host a People's Tribunal, greatly influenced by the work that we did in 92, because we hosted a People's Tribunal holding the United States on trial for crimes against humanity. Greatly to do with the agenda today. What grew out of today, I will just assert that now, with my drama mean, is that I was able to um, pencil in a date in February with Nicaragua, okay, to get our, um, our scholarship in line with what they're about to do down there, with the return of land to the, to the uh, African indigenous communities, the matriarchy, and we are doing that here, rematriating land, why not begin to expand that knowledge and that experience in the North? That is the driving theme, is that we need to really educate the North. We have no participation in the oppression in the, in the South. Our participation is as, as indoctrinated, you know, US citizens or residents of this particular North. Again, it was the border violence that brought me forth and witnessing at the border and knowing that the wildfire that can be created by us who reside in the north, who are tribally associated, who have that quote unquote, all of these sort of important things to Americans, recognition, uh, federal you know, status, you know, enrollment, but the blood quantum, those things have never been of any real true consequence to us, because we're still here. And if they had, we would have joined, you know, certain extermination. So let's get that card. Here we go. I would love to hear us read this together, starting with I will do pledge card, and then let's say, I, there you go. Pledge to resist imperialist policies to undermine peace in America, knowing that injustices continue to perpetuate it. I commit to organizing people power in order to stop militarization, extraction, and other forms of colonial domination. And so doing, I pledge to create inclusive forms of solidarity towards our common goal of peace in the hemisphere. Thank you so much. And as we wrap up here, I want to bring forward uh, two women who've been working nonstop for a long time now. Where is Michelle Elder? And Samantha Weary, Samantha, come up front. And Olivia, you should come up too. Hi, everyone, and thanks for everyone who has stayed throughout this whole day. Um, it's been such uh, an amazing experience to be here sharing with all of you and um, to be learning from so many great thinkers uh, who joined us today. And I just want to um, 
recognize the work that, uh, you know, not just me and Michelle put into this forum, but uh, all the endorsing organizations, the steering committee, um, Greg, um, Oscar, there are so many uh, amazing people that have uh, contributed uh, to making this uh, policy uh, forum uh, what it is and what uh, it has uh, become. So yeah, and of course, Michelle. Michelle has done such an amazing uh, work. Um, she created the website and just all the little details and everything. And of course, Angela and Fred, um, who also created the, the program and um, brought so many amazing ideas to the floor and made it uh, so that it would be a more inclusive uh, forum. Uh, so I just want to give a special shout out to everyone. Who and these wonderful women have an idea that this <clears throat> is the beginning of other types of gatherings like this. And since this was done in such a communal way, we are looking for other organizations that will come forward and say, we want to do something, whether it's bringing in all these issues or more specific, and then we want to all get behind that group and work with them, and it could be anywhere in this country. So we look forward to talking to you about the next forum and the next forum so that we keep going on. And of course, there's many, many other ways that we want to keep working together. Um, we want to make sure that we have a way to work with each of the groups in their, uh, what they're working on. And just even recognize that today there's people who are at a protest around Bukele in El Salvador. Yeah. There's our wonderful sisters who have been working for freedom for Pedro Castillo in Peru and for back to constitutional rule. We have fabulous people who have been working to get Cuba off the state sponsor of terrorism list. We have people who want to free Alex Song and Sanctions on Venezuela lifted and the three billion dollars that belongs to the Venezuelan people back to the Venezuelan people that's being held stolen from them. We've talked about so many wonderful issues. We also want to make sure you know that when you talk about the Americas, you have to talk about culture because there's so much inspiring, wonderful culture throughout the Americas. And that's why it's important that we gather together this evening at Bus Boys and Poets to hear from our cultural artists. And that is at the 14th and V Bus Boys and Poets this evening, starting at 7 p.m. Go, or go from here. Uh, we're gonna go from here. And we also want to recognize that while we've been learning from these great panelists and speakers, we've also been watching the beautiful art that's been created by our friend Lulo here. So stand up, Lulo, so we can recognize you. And please don't leave without taking a look at this wonderful artistic rendition of what we've been talking about today. Yes. Decolonize, it's even got the Malvinas in there for oh, anybody who oh. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got, um, we also want to say that there is a rally for Julian Assange that's happening on World Press Freedom Day. That's on Wednesday, May 3rd, 12 to 2, at the Department of Justice, and we'll march to the National Press Club. And of course, there is the event uh, t happening this evening of the White House Correspondents' Dinner. If anyone wants to go by there and join the people who will be blockading outside, calling for real movement on the climate crisis. Thank you.
So we've had a wonderful, wonderful time together today. And I've heard people mention twice already how under Hugo Chavez, there were these programs that brought not only heating oil, but really solidarity, north, south, south, north. And so I want to end just by remembering a time that I was in Venezuela when Hugo Chavez was addressing this mass auditorium of people, and he got them all fired up against the empire. Some of you might remember when he went to the United Nations and he talked about George Bush smelling like uh, sulfur. He was the devil. So he was talking about George Bush and the devil and those devils up in the north. And here we were, a group of people from the north that were sitting right there, and we started to start feeling like, oh, you know, let's kind of be invisible here. And he points to us. <laughs> and he says, but here are the people of Martin Luther King. And when we liberate ourselves from this empire, from the south, that we're going to fight to liberate ourselves, and we are working together with the people in the north who are trying to liberate themselves, we will be liberated in the Global South, and we will liberate the people of Martin Luther King. So get up, and he, and he acknowledged all of us, and we all had a great clap to understand that this liberation is coming up from the South, but it's boiling inside the empire right here in the Entrañas del Imperio in Washington, D.C. So we have so much global solidarity. I've been working on Ukraine, and every time I get really depressed about the war, I start reading about Latin America. So it's inspiring, it's wonderful. We know a lot of you have roots in Latin America, and we thank you so much for carrying those roots here with you today. And as we move forward, let us move forward, oh, uh, do giving donations. <laughs> Because this took a lot of money to put on, we will have donation baskets as you leave or up here as well, if you can put something into there. And we would like your photos. Oh, a group photo. And we have one more important person to thank here. Don't move, Tigberry. We want to thank Tig for all the work in putting the logistics of this together for the last few days, working so hard. And we're going to do, uh, where are we going to do the group photo? Yeah. So we're going to do a group photo here, right over here. And um, we're going to organize this with the tall people in the back so we know that that includes Nick Estes and Greg and <laughs> Leo. Tall people in the back, shorter ones in front. But let's give one more applause to everybody who worked so hard to make this day possible. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Ni un paso atrás. Venceremos. Venceremos, pero varios pasos adelante. 